Ikhlas. The opposite of Ikhlas, as everybody knows, is Riyah. And like Attar has a story of a man praying, Allahu Akbar, and then somebody hears the mosque door open, and he says, I'm, I, I'll pray longer, so they'll think I'm a really good person. And then he, he goes, long prayer, long sajda, and then when he finished, he looked to see who it is, and it was a dog that slipped into the masjid. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Or like the man who was, he was praying and somebody said to another person, SubhanAllah, that man, he prays so much, it's, it's unbelievable. And then the man said, don't forget to tell him about my fasting. Right? <laughs> you know? There's people like that. It's hard, seriously, there are people like that. And when that comes to your heart, because it's the nature of being human, right? Really, from the time we're children, we love praise. Children do the most wondrous things to get the attention of the parent, to get the attention of, of somebody who they feel has jah, they have a position. And, and we all want that. It's something that we have to fight that in ourselves. We have to fight it and oppose it and say, and I'll give you the cure for it. If everybody wants this, Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, according to the hadith, three times a day, in the morning and the evening, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika an ushrika bika wa ana a'lamu wa astaghfiruka mimma la a'lamu That's it. Do that three times in the morning and three times in the evening and do it in sajda and do it after your prayers, do it before your prayers, do it when you feel that happening. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika an ushrika bika wa ana a'lamu O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you that I should associate with you with knowledge. And I, see, and, and I seek refuge in you from what I don't know because riya is very subtle. Like one of the salaf, and this is from Bab Hasanat al Abrar, Sayyat al Muqarrabin. The good actions of righteous people are bad actions of the people in the divine presence. <laughs> one man used to pray every day in the first line. 20 years he did that. And then one day he went and he missed the takbirat al ihram and was in the last prayer and he felt ashamed that people would see him. So he decided not to go into the prayer. And what he said he realized from that is that he'd been praying 20 years with riya in his heart. And he actually made up all of the previous prayers. So that's a subtle, that's subtle riya. The, the, the hidden. And the Prophet said the shirk of his ummah sallallahu alayhi wa is like the movement of an ant on a smooth rock on a black night. So ikhlas has to be done and that's the cure for it. Now the warning about it is this. In the hadith in Sahih Muslim, according to the hadith, awwalu nas yuqda fihi yawm al qiyama rajulun ustushhida. The first people that are judged on the day of a man who's martyred He's brought before Allah and Allah shows him his blessings and then he says, what did you do with all the blessings I gave you? The man says, I fought for your sake. Allah says, you're a liar. You fought to be called a brave man and you were called a brave man. And then he's taken to the hellfire. And then the same is true of a scholar who learned knowledge to be called a scholar. And that was his reward because that's why he did it. The reward is according to the action. If, if the action was to be called a scholar, then you got your reward in the dunya. You know, and, and I, wallahi, that's why I have to say I'm, I'm not a scholar. And when I hear people say that, it, it scares me. Because one, it's not true. And two, uh, because if that's in my heart, then, I, then I'm in big trouble with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, to, to study so that, and Imam Madik said, even Imam Al-Jazuli said something that when I read it, it frightened me to death. He said, from Riyah is when you read some strange thing in a book and you remember it to tell other people in a majlis. I mean, that's, that's getting very subtle. And when I, when I said that to one of my sheikhs from Mauritania, he said, there might be some mubalagha in that. You know, but the point is, these people were very serious about protecting their hearts from riya. And the Prophet said, once he came to a group of Sahaba and they were making mention of something, he said, what are you talking about? They, he, they said, the Dajjal. And he said, can I tell you what frightens me more for my ummah than the Dajjal himself? And they said, what? And he said, sallallahu alayhi wa that they work for other than the sake of Allah. 
And we have a whole nation of people studying for pieces of paper. Wallahi, they're studying for pieces of paper. It's not knowledge. You can't tell me it's knowledge because I have the piece of paper. <laughs> so nobody can tell me it's knowledge. Because I went to the school and I sat in the classes and, and, and did that thing. And regret every, every minute of it. Right? It's not knowledge. You know, it's really, it's not. It's a lie. Now, I won't say that there are things like uh, medicine and engineering that have benefits in them. But the vast majority of what they're teaching is just absolute uh, nonsense. It's just nonsense. Psychology. Don't tell me getting, I'm getting a degree in psychology. Right? Oh, psychology in the Arabic language is ilm nafs And if you think these people know anything about the nafs, <laughs> just try reading some of their self-help books. Seriously. I mean, we've got Muslims reading uh, Stephen Covey. I mean, the reason I did that talk, I did a talk called Seven Habits of Muslims, was because all these Muslims, I was hearing, oh, did you read Covey's book and this and that? Subhanallah. You're taking your deen from a Mormon? <laughs> really, you're taking your deen? Because it's deen, it's about mu'amala. That book's all about how, you know, to, to be in the world. That's where you're taking your sunnah. And you say, no, but it's just like Islam. Well, then take it from Islam. Don't take it from him. Don't tell me, oh, it's just like Islam or he got it all from Islam. Why don't you go to the source that he went to if he got it all from Islam? Seriously, it's a madness. We've gone mad. Collectively. This is an ummah that is, has, has a collective madness right now. Wallahi. It's collective madness. So that, that's the reason. Now, the next thing, the most beneficial thing for achieving sincerity, according to Qadi Abu Bakr, and this is based on the Quranic truths, is truthfulness. Sitq. And this is why the highest maqam after the prophets is what? Siddiq. Right? Siddiq, al anbiya wa siddiqeen wa shuhada wa salihin. That's the tartib. The anbiya, the siddiqeen, the shuhada, the salihin. That's the tartib. The best are the prophets and then the siddiqeen. The highest siddiqa is Maryam alayhi salam. Right? Allah chose her over all the women of the world during her time. Right? And she's honored in being the mother of uh, Isa alayhi salam. And Isa is also honored by having Maryam for a mother. Allahu Akbar. So, the, and the highest Siddiq in our Ummah is Abu Bakr. And that's why he is the highest after the Messenger of Allah in Maqam according to our Aqidah. Abu Bakr Siddiq, that's his name. And, and the thing about Abu Bakr is he was Sadiq with Allah and with the Messenger of Allah. He was the truthful one. And the Messenger of Allah said, every heart wavered when I explained to Islam, about Islam to them, except Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. From the man, Khadija radiallahu anha al-Kubra. She knew, for, she married the Prophet because she knew he was going to be a Prophet. That's why she married him. She knew Waraka and she, she had, and so did one of the cousins of Waraka tried to marry Abdullah before Amina. Because she saw the light of Nabuwa in his face. So they knew, they, they had information. So sitq is something that we have to get. Now if you look, one of the most profound, I mean the whole Quran is profound, you can't say one of the most. I, I, I'm always trying to watch, guard my tongue about the Quran. But really, uh, uh, the, the ayah in the Quran, it's, we, we should deliberate all of the Quran. But this ayah in, about talking about this, a sitq, is Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, attaqullah, وَكُنُمْ عَصَادِقِينَ So, صُحْبَةَ صَادِقِينَ Being in the company of truthful people. And then, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَتَّقُوا اللَّهُ وَقُولُوا قَوْلًا سَدِيدًا Be truthful in your speech. يُصْلِحْ لَكُمْ عَمَارِكُمْ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبُكُمْ Allah will rectify your affairs in the dunya and He'll forgive you in the akhirah with sitq, being truthfulness. The first that has to be guarded of the tongue is al-kithib, which is lying. We cannot tell lies. We have to be truthful people. And this ummah, we're, it's unbelievable how many lies, you know, uh, this ummah, wallahi, we're lying to ourselves. We lie every time we say, ihdina sirat al-mustaqim. Every time we say, ihdina sirat al-mustaqim, we're lying. If we don't take the guidance. Because Allah refutes us immediately in the Quran when He says, Here's the guidance. 
You're asking for it, I gave it to you. There it is, right there. So prove yourself that you're not a liar when you say, Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim. And and the Messenger of Allah said, How many people recite the Quran and the Quran curses them? Because Allah says, Right? The liars. So we have to be truthful. Those who submit to Allah are seeking guidance. The next one is ghiba, backbiting. As an ummah, we have to stop doing this. We have to stop backbiting. Each individual has to make a commitment. And when you hear people backbiting, you have to tell them, I don't want to hear this. I can't hear this. What is backbiting? There are two definitions. The prophetic definition is obviously the best, but there's an extended fiqhi definition, which is important also. The prophetic definition is, ذِكْرُكَ أَخَاكَ بِمَا لَوْ سَمِعَهُ لَكَرِهَا It is to mention your brother, had he heard you saying it, he would dislike it. That is the prophetic definition. The, the faqih's definition is an extension of that, which says that it is to make mention of your brother in a distasteful way in which there's no need. In other words, sometimes it's necessary to say things about your brother uh, for, for reasons, and the ulama, they give uh, reasons for it. Uh, and, and they're this, tawallam, which is if somebody's an oppressor, it's permissible to tell somebody, help me, he's an oppressor, like to go to the judge and say, this man stole my property. He wouldn't like to hear that. But it's permissible in that position. Wasta'in, to seek help. Help me, this here's an oppressor here. Or help come, somebody's stealing, something like that. Or a stifti, to ask a fatwa. So if you go to a faqih and say, uh, my husband does this, this, and this. Like Hind, the, the wife of Abu Sufyan, went to the Messenger of Allah and said, Inna Aba Sufyan rajulun shahihun. He's a miserly man. If Abu Sufyan heard that, he'd be really upset. But she was telling him because she wanted a fatwa about whether she could take his money without his permission. So it's permissible in that case. Hadir, to make, to warn people about uh, somebody. Like if you've had a transaction with somebody and he's done wrong things, and somebody comes to you and says, yeah, he, you used to be in business with that person. I was thinking about going in business. What do you say? And you say, don't go in business with him. I had a bad experience. That is not ghibah, that's nasiha. The ulama make a condition, and that is that you don't add anything onto it that's not necessary. So you don't say, and by the way, he beats his wife, and by the way, he drinks, and by the way, right? You just leave it to what he needs to know about it, right? Seriously, and it's a temptation, because if somebody did something wrong to you, and this is a proof of what Sidi Muhammad Sharif was saying in his talk. It's a proof of that. That you only tell people what they need to know. Look at Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu. When he divorced his wife, one man came to him and said, why did you divorce your wife? And he said, I don't want to make ghibah. Because obviously there was something that was displeasurable. And then he said, he asked him what, what her mu'ashara was like. And he said, uh, I'm no longer married to her, so I have no right to tell you anything about her personal life. And that, that's taqwa. That is simple as that. How many people now will spend the rest of their lives complaining about their divorced wife or husband? To everybody that will give them an ear. 20 years I put up with that man. I used to bring him tea and he'd say, it's not hot enough. I used to make him food and he'd say, where'd you learn how to cook? Really, how many? There's a lot of people like that. And then there's men like that. I, that woman, all she did was scream at me. Ten years I put up with that, finally I got rid of her. Right? Why are you telling people that? She's a Muslim. Really, we have to shut up. It's taqwa, that's it. You know, this is what this deen's about. It's not, it's not a game because Yawm al is suddenly we're all going to say, Ya waylana! Ya hasrata! Well, that's what people are going to say. Ma farratu fi jambi la. Oh, I didn't do the rights of Allah. Why didn't I do it? Ya laytini lam attakhid fulana khalila. Oh, I wish I didn't spend time with this shaitan. This is what people are going to say. These are real expressions in the Quran that people will say. Irji'ni a'mal salihan. Let me go back. I'll do good. We don't want to be those people. We want to be people. Man ahabba liqa Allah ahabba Allahu liqa'ahu. And the one who loves to meet Allah is working for that day. That's the proof. It's not, oh yes, I want to die and meet Allah. I can't wait. The, many of the Sahaba were afraid. Because they, weren't, they didn't feel prepared yet. And that's why the Messenger of Allah said, don't desire death. 
because either you're a bad person and you still have time to make tawbah and do some good things before you die, or you're a good person and you want to increase in your goodness. Allahu Akbar. وَجْعَلَ الْحَيَاةَ زِيَادَةً لِي فِي كُلِّ خَيَرٍ In Sahih Muslim. Make my life increase in every good. And then عَرَّفْ بِدْعَةً فِسْقَ الْمُجَاهِرِ To let people know about a mubtadi' and, what, and I'll say about this, this is true. مَنْ 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 أَعَانَ مُبْتَدِعًا فَقَدْ أَعَانَ عَلَى هَدْمَ الدِّينَ Whoever helps a mubtadi' has helped to destroy this religion. Bid'ah is one of the most serious transgressions uh, in, the, in the deen. It really is. The mubtadi'un will not drink from the hold of the Prophet and we don't want to be from them. But there are many people who make masail, questions that are muhtadif fiha, that there's difference of opinion about them and they'll say this is a mubtadi'. That is not right. That is wrong to do that. Because everybody who has justifiable mushtahidun that have have given their proofs and their opinions about things, we have to respect those. If you, Mawlid is muhtarafi, there's a difference of opinion about it. Now what goes on is another matter. There are things in many of the ulama, like Ibn al-Hajj mentions, there are many bid'ah that go on in the mawalid and people should avoid them because of so many bid'ah. But the actual act of Mawlid, now in a country that makes war on the Mawlid, they're celebrating the hundredth anniversary of the birth of that nation right now they're celebrating it's everywhere I was just there it's everywhere the celebration of the birth of a nation and when I came on the airplane I'm telling you this film was as close as you get to shirk I mean it, I, it was unbelievable they had a film and it showed first a desert scene and it said from the from the depths of the Arabian Peninsula came a man with a great vision, a man of the greatest character, a character of nobility and honor, a man of lineage, a man of truth and sincerity. And you're waiting to say the messenger of Allah. It was King Abdul Aziz. <laughs> I'm serious. That, I, I, <laughs> some, right? Whew. And I'm not, you know, I'm not saying anything bad about it. I don't know the man, I didn't know him, anything like that. But when you want to talk about what came out of the Arabian Peninsula, g get your coordinates right. <laughs> right? Seriously, it wasn't in Nejd, it was in Mecca and Medina. That's what's great about that place. Really. And I told somebody, I said, listen, if it wasn't for Mecca and Medina, not a soul on this planet would be here other than Beni Harab and Beni Kelb and Beni Tamim. And, seriously, no, who would go there? Alexander the Great got to the doors of the Arabian Peninsula and he said, forget it, let's go back to Egypt. Right? Seriously. Herodotus said, nobody's ever wanted to conquer that place. <laughs> it was, and that's a secret. Allah made it a place that, that was unbearable. Because the one who could bear the greatest trust would come from that unbearable place. The Messenger of Allah would come from that place. And that's why it's great. And look what Ibn Abi Jamra said. One of the most beautiful things I've ever read about the Messenger of Allah in Ibn Abi Jamra's commentary on Sahih Bukhari. He said, the wis one of the greatest wisdoms of the Hijrah is that had the Messenger of Allah never left Mecca, people would think that Mecca was honored before the Prophet وسلم, because of Abraham. And they wouldn't see that the deep honor that the Messenger of Allah had just by his very being. And this is why he said Medina, a place that had no honor before the Messenger of Allah made Hijrah. So when he went there, it was a proof that the Haram became a Haram because just like Abraham made Mecca a Haram, السلام, our Prophet السلام, made Medina a Haram. And then he said, even more so than that, the most honored place in the whole city was the Masjid because that's the place he spent the most time. And the most honored place in the masjid was the Rodah because it was between his house and the mihrab and he spent more time walking between those two places than any other place in the masjid. And the most sacred place in the entire universe by ijma, according to Qad Iyad in the Shifa is the place that contains the blessed body of our Messenger of Allah. That is ijma, mujma ali. And it's a Rodah. It's a road them in Riyadh al Jannah. It's it's in paradise. That place is in paradise. And then finally, 
after all of those things uh, is then mira which is argumentation we have to stop arguing argumentation has no benefit in this deen none Imam Malik would, would leave when there was argument if people start arguing and somebody I'll tell you and, and I, I'm just starting to get you know people have to realize if somebody has studied the deen for several years and you have not you cannot argue with that person even if you disagree with them because you do not have the requisite information to argue with that person argumentation is something that is makru amongst the ulama but it's haram amongst the awam according to the ulama and this is why Imam al Ghazali said leave knowledge to the ulama leave knowledge to the ulama that does not mean don't become an, a scholar but what it means is if you're not an alim don't start speaking about knowledge because you don't have it and this is why Imam al-Bukhari says Bab al-ilmi qabla al-qawli wal amal the book or the chapter of knowledge before speaking or doing anything so really we have to guard our tongues about argumentation I mean there's people argue all the time now and this is why Imam Ali was asked, how do you know a man? He said, if he speaks, I know who he is instantly. And if he shuts up, I'll work it out in a day. <laughs> right? Somebody speaks, he'll, he'll expose himself immediately. Either he's a fool or he's an intelligent person because a man lies hidden under his tongue. So we have to learn our place in the world. This is part of adab. Really, it's part of adab. A student of knowledge is not the same as somebody who's not a student of knowledge. And just because you have your, uh, you know, your book uh, like Fiqh Sunnah in your house in translation, and your Muhsin Khan Bukhari in translation, and your, uh, your uh, Noble Quran in translation, does not mean that you are a scholar or even a student of knowledge. Because one of the secrets of this deen is it's taken from other human beings. The Messenger of Allah was taught by Jibreel. The ulama say the wisdom in that is to teach the ummah that knowledge is taken from teachers. And he said, Right? The Prophet was sent to teach people, but he himself was taught, and he was taught by somebody who was less in stature than he was. Which is a sign that we should take from people. Somebody might know Tajweed and that's all he knows. And I might be a faqih. And so my knowledge is greater than his knowledge because knowledge of fiqh is over knowledge of tajweed. But I have to humble myself if I don't know tajweed and go to him and have him teach me tajweed. We have to be humble and, and you cannot learn. The, the, one of the salaf said, لا, لا يتعلم إث, إث, إثناني uh, مستكبر ومستحيين uh, a, An arrogant person and somebody who's too shy. And that's called haya madhmum. And I've been going on a long time but the last thing I'll finish is mizah, uh, mirthfulness, jesting all the time. Mizah uh, is a disease of the heart. And that does not mean that we can't be light from time to time. But we should not, and especially in these times, we should not be light people. We have to be weighty people because we've been given a great amana, a great weightiness. And so my advice to myself and all of you is First and foremost, to make a musharata with Allah, to implement what you've just heard. Really, make, and I'm making this with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should make a serious uh, effort in learning these things. We're living in dark ages, but we've been given the light of Islam. And, and I'll tell you something, one of the most powerful realities of this deen is it never leaves you without guidance, ever. And even if the hour is coming upon you, and in your hand is a fasila, then pl finish planting it. Look at, even when the hour comes, we have guidance. We know what to do. When the Titanic goes down, and I think it's going down, I could be wrong. We, we want to bring lifeboat. We want to bring the lifeboat of Islam. And, and we want to, come on board, there's plenty of room, right? Seriously, come on board. It's, it's going to be tight, but hey, we've been to Mecca, we know what tight's like. There's no problem, we can be patient. Come on board. There's water, there's biscuits, not much. Right, we look pretty pathetic right now, but it's a lifeboat. And the alternative is to sink. 
right? So really, invite them on. We're on a life, it looks bad. We used to have a big ship just like they did. <laughs> we used to have a big one, but it sunk like all ships sink. It went down, the Ottomans went down, the, the Seljuks went down, they all went down, their ships went down, but whenever their ship went down, Allah survivors got on some lifeboats and went somewhere else and built a new one. Well, all we've got left is those lifeboats, but alhamdulillah, it's, it's better than nothing. So let's use them and let's invite people on, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan, assalamu alaikum.